Thank you, Jens, and good morning, friends. My name is Rebecca Lamont. I'm one of the pastors serving here at First Presbyterian Church, and I'm so glad to welcome you to this time of worship, whether you're here live on Sunday morning or joining us sometime later in the week. It's good to connect in this way. A word of thanks before we begin to Jens Korndorfer and our soloist, Wade Thomas, and Elder Michelle Guerin, who are leading this, helping to lead this service this morning and lending their talents. It's good to be with you all, too. A couple of quick announcements. First, if you would, please use our text check-in platform. If you are a first-time visitor, welcome. Text the number 1 and the letters ST to make FIRST to 313131, and you'll receive some prompts so that we can gather information and be in touch with you directly this week. If you've checked in many times, text the word CHECK-IN, C-H-E-C-K-I-N, to 313131. The FPC Women's Ministry invites you to join Morning Watch, which is a new Facebook Live devotional group meeting at 8.30 a.m. on Tuesdays, just to set the tone for the week, starting with prayer, reflection, and fellowship. And I'm glad to announce that on Friday, September 18th at noon, you're all invited to join us for our first Box Lunch, Friday concert series co-presented with Concerts at First here at our church and the Emory Chamber Music Society of Atlanta. This will be a live streamed concert featuring Beethoven violin and cello sonatas with several familiar musicians from our most recent chamber music concerts that were in the sanctuary. Tune in through the Concerts at First tab on the website or on our Facebook page. Now, Elder Michelle Garrett will lead us in this morning's call to worship, printed in your digital bulletin. Good morning, and thank you for joining us here at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. Please join me in the call to worship. Lord, we come to you for understanding. Teach us your ways. Turn us away from vanity and selfishness. Show us your paths and help us walk in righteousness. Give us a whole new way of life. We open our whole hearts to you, O oh God. Amen. Uh. It's 
that seals each time I tell it more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God. and his love I love to tell the story for those who know it best seems hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest and when in scenes of glory I sing the that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story it will be my theme in glory to tell the old story of Jesus and his love. Amen. Thank you, Wade. Good morning, friends. My name is Lee Bonner, and I'm one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, you make every day anew, and we give you thanks for this day as we do for every day. We love to tell the story when we wake up and we see your creation that reminds us of how much you love us and you care for us. Lord, we love to tell the story when we wake up and we see family, when we hear from friends, when we know in our hearts that you arise with us, that you wait for us as we open our eyes to your new world. As we wake up each day, we ask that you help us remember what is going on in your world through your eyes. When you open our eyes up in the morning, we give you thanks that we have life, that we have health, that we have healing. When we open our eyes in the morning, we give you thanks that you are getting us up and getting us going and readying us for ministry in your world. We ask that when you open our eyes in the morning, you open our eyes to all that is happening around us. We ask that you open our eyes to the revelation that you bring every day, the revelation of your love, your grace, and your joy, and also the revelation of the things that we have done and left undone that we have not yet seen. Open our eyes, O oh Lord. Open our eyes to the revealing of things happening now, that our eyes and hearts may be so open that we cannot turn them away, that we can only turn them toward your love, your joy, your grace, and your peace, that those things may become desires for your world that are our own. We pray that we will tell the story of those things in those places where they have not yet been revealed. We pray that we will tell that story through our actions, through our words, and through our very presence. We pray that you will open our eyes so that the story we tell might be the story that needs to be told in the time and place that you have called us to enter. Give us the story, Lord, that the world needs to hear. Give us the story that each situation needs to hear. That our lives in this world, that our embodiment of your grace, your love, your joy, and your peace may transform us and our community and our world 
into the place that you desire. In Christ, we pray all these things, him who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today, our first reading comes from the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, chapter 119, verses 33 through 40. Listen and hear the word of the Lord. Teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees, then I will keep them to the end. Give me understanding, and I will keep your law, and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. Preserve my life in your righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Hear again God's word for you and for me. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, we turn to your old and holy word. Let it speak something new to us. Let it change us and open us to new life. Amen. When everything moved to an online format back in mid-March, one of the things we added to our church life was a daily devotional. So from March to August, members of the staff took turns writing about one of our lectionary texts for our assigned days, and then those were emailed out every morning to the congregation. There wasn't a single theme. We weren't coordinating our devotionals to make them into a series. We just read the Bible texts for the day and shared our thoughts and our prayers from them. We've had a lot of positive feedback from those devotionals. They really helped us stay connected as a church family. I got emails that said things like, I've never really read that scripture before, or I've never heard it that way before. In fact, some of my most meaningful connections this summer came after devotionals when something that had been on my mind was the same as what was on some of yours. I learned a lot of new things about you, where you're from, 
what music stirs your souls, what lessons you learned growing up, what Bible verses you had to memorize in your life, whether you liked it or not. I even learned that some of your loved ones are buried in the historic cemetery near our home where the Lamans often walk in the late afternoon. It has been a gift to connect with you as we read the Bible together. But I also had several emails over the summer asking about the lectionary itself. This thing that we referred to in our devotionals and we mention it before sermons, these are the lectionary texts of the day. People asking me, what is that? And where can I find it and how do you use it? So since we're lingering in the lectionary here in this season and both our texts for today are lectionary texts, I wanna take a moment just to talk about the lectionary and more importantly, how we read the Bible why we read the Bible, and what we do with it. Because, friends, God's Word is alive, and we need to hear what God has to say. The lectionary, its real name is the Revised Common Lectionary, is really just a calendar of readings. It's a division of the Bible into smaller sections, and they're assigned to days on a three-year cycle. So if you really stuck with it and read the text for each day, you would read through almost the whole Bible, there are a few things that aren't included, in about three years. There are readings assigned for every single day of the week and for each Sunday. And through the wonders of the internet, you can have them sent to your email or look them up by date and see all the texts in one place. The lectionary always includes a reading from the Old Testament, which Michelle just shared for us, a reading from a psalm, actually that was the one, a reading from one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and a reading from the rest of the New Testament, which I just read from the letter to the Romans. Now, we don't use it exclusively here at First Pres, but it's a tool that helps us engage with our scriptures. And I find it to be a really helpful tool for a few reasons, worth noting before we turn to those lectionary texts. For one thing, In a chaotic time, it roots us in the rhythm of our faith. We even get a different calendar with the lectionary. It isn't organized by the calendar year or school year or fiscal year. It doesn't start on January 1 or July 1. It doesn't align with tax season or online school season or election season or football season or flu season. It follows the liturgical year. So it starts with the first Sunday of Advent. So we, as Christians, will flip to our new year with Advent because a new year for us comes with preparing and hoping for the Savior of the world. I don't know about y'all, but I need that reminder that the new year we're all longing for, especially here in 2020, comes when we start getting ready for Jesus. This is good news in a year that has been so disordered and disrupted. God is coming to reorder the world. Second, the lectionary helps us read more of the Bible. If we're left to our own devices, we tend to cherry pick the verses and stories that we already know. We'll go again and again to some parts of the Bible and not read other parts much at all. Sometimes we just wanna be comforted by what's familiar. Sometimes we're intimidated by texts that are harder to understand, so we'll avoid those. Sometimes we just forget about some books. If you're honest, when was the last time you read Haggai or Obadiah, for example? We do this with everything in our lives. We go with what we know. But when we follow an order of readings, we didn't pick ourselves we explore so much more of our wide and complicated scriptures. And third, the format of the lectionary reminds us to start with God's word and to listen to what it says to us rather than starting with what we think and going to the Bible to find a scripture that agrees with us. The main reason that I look to the lectionary for scriptures on any given day is to be surprised. If I were to decide before I ever open the Bible what I wanna say or teach or preach, 
and then I go find a scripture that supports my argument, I close myself off from what God might be trying to say to me. Perhaps you've heard these terms, eisegesis and exegesis sometime in a Bible study or some kind of other study. That's what that's talking about. Eisegesis means interpreting a text by reading our ideas into it, while exegesis with the prefix ex, meaning out, like exit, is a drawing meaning out of a text. When we go to scripture with open minds and hearts, we are more likely to hear God's voice rather than just our own reflected back to us. Sometimes we'll hear God in books we don't often use, sometimes in stories that don't seem to relate to our context, but by the movement of the Holy Spirit, the text surprises us and teaches us something new. When we start with our own agendas, we shut down the living part of this living word. We reduce the Bible to a sort of database to be searched for supportive citations, or even worse, for a tool to further our own agendas. It's been happening for a long time. People have been using God's holy word for their own ends for centuries, and unfortunately, the year 2020 has been no exception. This year, if you've been listening, politicians and interest groups and preachers and public figures have used the Bible on a public stage. But when that happens, we have to heed the words of 1 John 4, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. Not everyone who claims to speak from the Holy Word has actually been changed by it. In a divided nation in an election year, in the face of two pandemics of COVID-19 and racial injustice, we see more than ever that how we read the Bible matters. How we use the Bible matters. In the words of the great preacher Barbara Brown Taylor, people of faith must beware those who cannot tell God's will from their own. The Bible isn't a prop. It isn't a talking point to support a platform or a personality. It isn't a weapon we pull out to show that we're right. It isn't ours to manipulate, to swap out words, when we don't like some and put in words we do. It isn't background footage for sound bites or a menu of values to be mixed and matched as we prefer. It isn't a stump speech. Let me be clear, the Bible doesn't belong to any political party or any candidate or any country. It is not and has never been politically expedient. Just the opposite. This holy word witnesses to God's order that exists over human politics and powers. It exists as a divine corrective to them. Both of our lectionary texts for today remind us that we read scripture to follow God's way, not our own. They give us guidance to order our lives even in chaotic times. For most of this summer, the daily lectionary has moved painstakingly through Psalm 119, bit by bit, through 176 verses. I think we've been in it so long that two of my own devotionals were about parts of the same psalm. So when I saw that Psalm 119 was still our lectionary text for this morning, my first thought was, what else is there to say? We did this one already this summer. It's still a long psalm about God's law. But as I tried to listen for the surprise it had for me, I realized that nothing could be more timely here in a summer of disruption. Nothing could be more helpful than to dwell for a really long time on a prayer that names all the things we've been thinking like the fact that God's ways are really different from the behavior we see around us. 
and the fact that we need God to keep showing us what's right and to help us do it. The psalm names a lot of the same kinds of chaos and disruption we're experiencing now. Sickness, pain in our bodies, troubled minds, disorientation, especially when we're separated from each other, fear, feelings of powerlessness, violence. The psalmist describes being persecuted by powerful people and falsehoods being spread about him even before the internet. He laments because arrogant people are smearing him with lies. We can relate. We feel perplexed and sad and angry as we get more and more used to a culture of labeling and name calling and lies. And even realize that we're drawn to that behavior ourselves. I can't even count the number of conversations I've had where someone has lamented the fact that public discourse has devolved into meanness and arguing, saying we seem unwilling or unable to listen to each other. We've forgotten that we can hold differences without labeling someone as our enemy. The psalmist is experiencing that kind of chaos too. And in that experience, he prays to know and to follow God's law when everything else around him is a false kind of order, order that's created only through the use of fear. He praises God's law and he thanks God for giving it to us, but he also talks about how hard it is to follow, especially when others are not. He asks God to keep him from falling into the false ways he sees around him. Over and over for 176 verses, he asks to know God's law and to follow God's way. So Psalm 119 brings us a perfectly timed word. The eight verses Michelle just read remind us that we're not adrift. We have a God that is older and stronger than the false forms of order we see in 2020. When all feels chaotic, when we wonder to ourselves whether every goodness and civility is lost, when we don't know what to do in the face of just so much, we do as the psalmist did. We turn ourselves back to God's law and God's way. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I'll observe them. Give me understanding that I can keep your law. Lead me in the path of your commandments, because I delight in your path. Turn my heart to you and away from selfish gain. The Apostle Paul was also writing about God's law. He was trying to instruct early Christians so that they could understand and live out God's order through what were also confusing times. Early Christians faced competing claims about law and and what was required of them. So Paul turns them back to God's commands. And in the section I read just a few minutes ago, Paul gets really concrete about what God's law means for how we treat each other both as a community and person to person. It's lovely in its simplicity and directness, really. Paul says that to fulfill God's law is to love. Love. The other commandments, don't murder, don't steal, don't covet, etc., are summed up in one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, that's pretty familiar ground for us as Christians, but it's timely here again today because Paul says two other things about God's law. First, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Let me repeat that. Love does no wrong. The kind of love Paul is talking about here isn't emotion. He isn't suggesting that we'll feel happy about the people in our lives who were difficult He doesn't expect us to somehow suddenly feel affection 
for those who belittle and label and call names. He doesn't think we'll start liking those who've been excluding us or have warm fuzzies about those arrogant smearers. Because love here isn't just a feeling. The love that fulfills God's law is an action to promote the good of another person. We might never want to hug our neighbor, even when it isn't COVID time, but we must still act to promote that neighbor's well-being. In fact, the other thing Paul says that I've often overlooked in this text is that we actually owe that kind of love as a debt to one another. Verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love. Now, I usually just hear, owe no one anything, full stop, and it sounds like a lesson in good financial practice, you should stay out of debt. But here, Paul reminds us that according to God's law, we owe every other person a debt of love, a debt of acting for their well-being. Love is their due in God's economy Because in God's economy, we have received grace through the ultimate act of love. This debt is more than just charity or an act of kindness. It's more than being friendly or not getting into arguments in the comments section in Facebook. Love is actively seeking what is good for our neighbor. Now, there are a lot of different ways that we define ourselves into groups. This time of pandemic and political polarization has actually highlighted them, brought them into sharp relief for us. There are folks we see not just as different from us, but as threats to us. There are people whose stories we will not hear or accept. There are those who make us feel defensive right out of the gate. There are those we've cast as enemy because we hold different opinions. And messages all around us tell us how we should handle those people. We should avoid them or blame them. We can argue with them and convince them that we're right. Or we can at least know who they are and put a label on them. Above all, we should make sure that they don't gain any power. Do you hear this language around you? Language of us versus them? How often do you hear or maybe even say something that starts with, they always, or they never, or, well, what about what they did? Romans 13 reminds us that we owe each of those they's, each of those others, a debt. Each of those people is our neighbor, and we owe them a debt of love. We don't have to feel lovey about those we see as enemy. In fact, we may never feel any differently than we do now. But loving our neighbors means taking action for their good. Our enemy's well-being is our responsibility. If we lived this command to act for someone else's good, our world would change. We would speak in ways that honor each other. We would take responsibility for the health and safety of our siblings in Christ. We would use our time and money and influence not just for what we need and want, but to fulfill God's law. Love your neighbor. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Friends, in this chaotic time, God still speaks. Sometimes through unexpected texts and in surprising ways, but always reminding us that God's law and order are not based on fear, violence, and arrogance. God's law is love that same love that came in the person of Jesus Christ to offer the ultimate act of sacrifice for our well-being and to reorder the world forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.
take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my voice and let me sing, always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages for Thee, filled with messages for Thee. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at Thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only Amen. Friends, go now from this time of worship back into your lives, however they are ordered right now, and know that the Word of God still lives, still speaks to us, and still gives us what we need to live faithfully and in love to each other. With that confidence, be at peace. Amen. <laughs>